Welcome everyone, my name is Karen Zagantz and I'm the director and flute faculty member for Z-Tunes Music. I'm excited to welcome the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra bass player Michael Kurth as our clinician today. Mr. Clark has been a member of the ASO bass section since 1994 and is also a prolific composer. His compositions have been performed by the ASO, Florida Orchestra, Houston Symphony, Melbourne Symphony, and Riverside Chamber Players. He serves on the faculty of Emory University as artist affiliate in double bass. For today's clinic, we're going to stay on mute the whole time while Mr. Kurth works through the GMEA bass audition excerpt. I suggest you have your copy of the excerpt and a pencil ready to make notes. He's also made a lot of notes for you, you might want. You can type any questions you'd like to ask in the chat box and we will ask them at the end of the performance. Off to you, Mr. Kurth. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Hi. Um, okay, middle school. Uh, etude for bass. Can we can we look at it on screen, Karen, please? Okay, so this is this is a version I made for y'all that um, I, I, I hope uh, Karen will be able to email to you or make available to you at some point. It's got some fingering notes and stuff. Um, most important thing about this is um, well, we're going to break it into two parts. We're going to break it into left hand and right hand. Um, right hand, uh, well, which which is my right hand? This one's my right hand. Bow hand. There we go. Okay, bow hand. The articulation is the important thing in this one. We see eighth notes with staccatos and quarter notes with tenutos. And some of the quarter notes have accents and a couple of the quarter notes have, have staccatos as well. It's a little bit confusing. Um, this is a, a lot like, a, like when, a, when, when a professional player has an orchestra excerpt to play in an audition. Articulation is a lot of, a lot of it. Um, we'll see some Brahms or Mahler excerpts where every single note has a different articulation. Um, this, is, this is a little bit like that. All the eighth notes I think are reliably staccato and either mezzo forte, forte, or fortissimo. So the important thing with the articulation with the right hand is to stay near the frog all the time. And um, this, is, this is a stroke that, it's, the dot means staccato, but for us as bass players, a more, a more uh, appropriate term for this stroke is martelet because it means hammered. Um, and with my students, a lot of times I call this the money stroke because you can't make any money unless you know how to play this stroke. Um, so, first thing to do is to, is to, is to get um, your metronome at 88, subdivided into eighth notes. And you can see how, how little my bow is at that point. I'm right at the frog, I'm using about two inches of bow. Um, the shape of this stroke is really important. You want to start near the string and release the bow so there's air after it. Instead of, you don't want it choked. Um, this might be getting a little bit advanced, but there's two ways you can, you can, you can make a stroke short. With your speed, with, um, by stopping it, and with your weight, by lifting it. This is a case where we're going to lift the, lift the bow instead of stopping the bow. So uh, hopefully the zoom will keep up with me enough for you to be able to see this stroke in action. But I'm going to bring my lens down a little bit. Okay, so all the eighth notes are going to have that off the string. Martelet kind of feel. Quarter notes are going to be tenuto, which is that line, which doesn't mean legato. Tenuto means, um, usually in, in a string player's case, only a little bit of space between notes. Pretty long, but not, not, not really legato. Not, but a little bit of space. Um, okay, so that's left hand stuff. Um, now, you can see throughout the excerpt, the, the dynamic varies between forte and fortissimo. Forte again, mezzo forte, sometimes there's crescendos. The first crescendo in measure uh, 11 goes nowhere because you're back at mezzo forte by measure 13. The crescendo in 13 goes up to the forte. All this means is anytime you see a dynamic um, that, that, that's gonna tell, with this kind of stroke, it's how much weight you're going to use, how heavy you're going to bow. So here's, here's the forte weight. And 
fortissimo. A lot more weight. Um, another one thing I guess I should mention about this stroke is rosin is your friend. Use a lot of rosin. Don't be, don't be afraid of rosin. A lot of players your age and a lot of school systems, um, they, they're kind of stingy with the rosin and they'll pass around one, one cake of Pops rosin for three years between the whole section. You guys sections like that? Um, rosin makes your bow sticky. It makes your bow grab. It's, it's what your bow is supposed to do. Um, put as much rosin on as you want. If it sticks too much, you can wipe a little bit off, like on your sock or your pants or whatever. But you want enough rosin on that it's easy to articulate these notes at fortissimo. Um, rosin makes your bow a lot easier to use. Um, if, you're, if you don't have enough rosin on, it's going to be really hard. Um, it's going to be really uh, a lot of effort to get that articulation out, to get the tone out in a, in a good level. Um, rosin is your friend. Be grateful for rosin. Yay, rosin. Okay, so that's, um, that's left-hand stuff. I mean, that's, that's right-hand stuff. I always mix up my right and left. I need tattoos on my hands. Left, right, there we go. Um, okay, so right hand, short bows, Stay near the frog all the time. I've put some bowings in this part that weren't in the original. Um, basically, it's down bow on every downbeat, which if you start down bow, it'll always be down bow until you get to that rest in measure eight, after which point you take another down bow. Same thing in measure six, 16. Always down bow on the downbeat because if you don't do it, you're gonna mess up your bow. It's gonna be backwards. You're not gonna have enough bow for the, for the quarter notes on the ups. So always down bow on the downbeats. I'm a little bit confused about the articulations in measure one and two on the quarter notes. There are accents on those quarter notes in those bars, but no accents anywhere else in the original. I think it's kind of implied that you would put accents on the other quarter notes. Um, it doesn't make any sense that there wouldn't be accents anywhere else. Um, but then again, the question with auditions is how, how accurately do you play what's on the page? Do you play exactly what's on the page or do you interpret a little bit? Um, in this case, I'd probably go ahead and interpret, add, add some accents on the other quarter notes. Accents on these quarter notes means basically a little bit more force at the front of the note, backing off into the, into the, dy the dynamic that you're already in. So you can see how I'm, I'm not changing the speed. I'm changing the weight. So a little bit of a little bit of added weight at the, at the beginning of each of those quarter notes. Another thing that's a little bit confusing is um, measure eight and measure sixteen. Those quarter notes, measure eight, the G in measure eight has a dot on it, but it, the me one in measure sixteen does not. A um, little bit confusing. I don't know why. And then a final thing that's a little bit confusing to me is in the original. If you're looking at the original part. Some of the fingerings have a line over them or under them, like a four or a two will have a, like a, a tenuto line above it or under it. I have no idea what that means. It doesn't mean tenuto because it doesn't it doesn't seem to make any sense if those if those couple of notes here and there are, are tenuto, but the other eighth notes are not. Um, as far as I can tell, and I, I tried to dig into this a little bit today and, and find out what exactly the editor meant by those. I think they have to do with what position you're in, and where you shift. Um, so. I have decidedly, um, or I've decided to abandon those, um, those notations in favor of some little arrows, which you can see on the, on the page there. For me, the arrows mean pivot. I'm going to show you what I mean by pivot. Um, when you're in first position, uh, for instance, on the G string, fourth finger is B natural, right? So what happens if you put second finger on B natural? while leaving your thumb where it goes. Thumb right behind second finger, move second finger to B natural, and then all of a sudden fourth finger has C. Anybody ever do that before? Like with your C major scale? Anybody want to nod? Hello? No? Okay. All right, well, so here's like in, G, in C major. You can go. Put two on B. 
That's called a pivot. It's called a pivot. If you leave thumb where, where it goes behind second finger. Basically, it gives you one more note above first position to access while staying in first position. And similarly, you can, you can pivot backwards to G sharp or A flat. So now first position, if we include that pivot be, be, behind second, behind with thumb staying in place, we now have one, two, three, four, five notes in first position instead of just three. Instead of A, B flat, and B, we have A, G sharp behind it, B flat, B, and C above it. So now first position becomes much broader. Uh, Karen, could you put up that second graphic, please? Sure, coming right up. Thanks. And Did scroll down it? just yeah, right there. Okay, so okay. here's here's my um, here's first position. Um, you can see on the E, A, D, and G strings, those are the those are the first fret notes, second fret, or um, and in first position. Um, sorry, you can't see where I'm pointing because Karen's got it. Um, under under Roman numeral one position, that's regular first position. First finger on A, B flat, and B on the G strings. First, second, fourth finger. But if you move one, if you move two back to where one was, you get the flat side of first position, A flat, A, and B flat. If you move one up to where two was, you get the sharp side of first position, B flat, B, and C. Um, okay, thanks. You can put it back to the etude now. Cool. Um, can we put it back to the, there we go, thanks. Okay, so what I've done with these little arrows is indicate where you're gonna move to the sharp side with, a, with an up arrow and to the flat side with a down arrow. Um, and there's a couple of other brackets we're gonna look at in a minute. But, so in the first measure, we're gonna use this, the time during the, the D, open D to move up to first finger on C instead of B. And then we have four finger for D and four finger for G, which is nice because then we don't have to get that nasty open string sound, which can be kind of you know invasive and, and kind of a little bit um, icky. And also lets you vibrate if you. If you know how to vibrate, there's some opportunities to do it there. Um, and one of my rules about shifting or pivoting is. Move when you have time to move. If you have an open string or a, or a rest or a very short note, that's a good time to move. Like so, a lot of these a lot of these arrows are during when you have open strings. So that what I'm going to do there is move when I have time to move. Move during the open string. Move. So move when you have time to move. Um, Sometimes you have to move really quickly in between two eighth notes, like in measure three. Um, but you have options there too. So if you, if you notice, I mean, just we don't have to go back to the, the fingering chart, but in measure three, that the second eighth note B is with four is with two, if you want it to be. But you have options for B because you know how to pivot now. So four, you can go back to four on the B if you want, or two and then one on the A. Uh, similarly, like between measures four and five, you can pivot after the G to play two on the C, or you can put one on the C. Either way, whatever is more comfortable for you. The right fingering is the one that works for you. And the fingering that I put in this part is similar to the one that's in the original, and it's one that works. I know it works for me. It, it'll theoretically work for you, but if it doesn't work for you as well as you know, pivoting in different spots, the fingering that works for you is the one you should use. My teacher used to say, if you, if, if, if you play with your feet, it's fine as long as it sounds good. So feet are probably not going to be necessary during the All-State audition, but anyway. Um, OK, so here's our etude. Um, next tricky thing. So, OK, so first, the first line is all in first position, first six measures all in first position with some pivots. And again, the pivot is it means you leave your thumb in first position, but you move your fingers one note, one fret, one half step up or down, flat or sharp. And that's what the arrows indicate. 
when we get to measure 7, it's a high E. Um, some of you probably know where that note is just fine. Some of you may not have played it before. E, easiest way to find E is when you shift and your thumb hits right this, right in this corner right there. First finger would be D, fourth finger is E. Every bass is a little bit different. Some of you are going to be a little bit off. With D might be a little bit behind it or above it or whatever. But um, the way to find the E or the D is uh, there's a harmonic right there. Um, you know what harmonics are? Harmonics are those places you touch the tune or where, you know, where the string plays a, a high note without you actually pressing it. So at, at, at first finger D, there's a high D harmonic. At fourth finger E, there's a high B harmonic. Also, another way to check this is E with four on G string is the same as the first finger harmonic on the A string. So after measure six, take a break there, jump up, find E. And then we're back to first position with C with four. Okay, next fingering trick. In measure nine, see that, that horizontal bracket over some of the notes? That indicates you could you could be you could be in pivoted down first position, but you're, you're you're there for a while, so we might as well just move our whole hand into half position at that point. Half position, first finger at first fret, first finger at the at a, a, a sharp. I mean, I'm sorry, G sharp. So that whole horizontal bracket indicates you're in half position for those notes. Same thing with the bracket in measure 12. And then we, we move it. We, you see, we move into half position during the open string D. We move out of out of half position during the open G. So again, shifting. We have time to shift. And the final trick is the same high E in measure uh, 22 as you had in measure 19, 20, 23 as you had in measure seven. Cool. So that's the etude. Uh, we, we, can, we can stop and ask any questions now if you guys have any chat questions. Any chatters? I don't see any questions coming up, but I was wondering, can you play it through for us? Sure, I can try. and for all your valuable insight on this. Even I'll send out these PDFs, and I think that's going to be so useful for the kids. Yeah, yeah hopefully, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Kurth, and we'll Good see luck. everyone. Good luck on your auditions. Good luck, guys. Everybody, thanks. Bye.